The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them, and he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Welcome to the summer sermon series that our Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada is providing for congregations. I'm Larry Kochendorfer and I serve as the Bishop of the Synod of Alberta and the Territories. It's great to be with you this Sunday and to be able to give your dear pastor or deacon and lay leaders some much welcomed relief. Our rostered and lay leaders have been offering an incredible ministry over the course of the past year, but it's been hard work and we need to do everything we can to give them our encouragement and support. As I prepare today's sermon, I want to acknowledge my appreciation for the writings of Caroline Lewis, Bradley Schmeling, and Barbara Brown Taylor, and the preaching resource Feasting on the Word. I have significantly borrowed their wisdom and insights and their words in the shaping of today's sermon. Let us pray. Into your hands, almighty God, we place ourselves, our minds to know you, our hearts to love you, our wills to serve you, for we are yours. Into your hands, incarnate Savior, we place ourselves. Receive us and draw us after you, that we may follow your steps. Abide in us and enliven us by the power of your indwelling. Into your hands, O hover hovering spirit, we place ourselves. Take us and fashion us after your image. Let your comfort strengthen, your grace renew, and your fire cleanse us, soul and body, in life and in death, in this world of shadows and in your changeless world of light eternal, now and forever. Amen. When our family moved to Edmonton, Alberta in 2002, I recall getting stuck in a traffic circle near our home in the congregation to which I'd been called. This was a traffic circle with five entrances and of course, five exits, and I would get stuck in the inside lane going round and around, passing my exit several times. Our minds can be like that, or at least mine can. I can get stuck in a loop. I revisit conversations in my mind, wishing that I had said something different, or at least in a different way, practicing in my head what I wished I had said. I revisit arguments and I make my case point by point to my invisible and absent antagonist. Sometimes I just stew, 
usually over something so ridiculous. Or lately, I seem fixated on a theme, politics or COVID, or details for our son's wedding service, which took place recently. At times, my mind is like a dog with a bone I can hardly let go. I suspect that some of you may understand. There are times, even during a Zoom meeting, that I see a participant's lips moving. I check to see if the individual is unmuted. And sometimes their lips are moving even though nothing's being said. And sometimes there's just a look in someone's eyes on Zoom. And I know that something is going on, that something is going around and around in their mind. There is huge energy in stewing. It's circular energy. It moves round and round with no exit ramp, no entrance ramp for anyone else either. Just round and round and round. I wonder if this kind of energy, this circular energy, gives us a way of considering the two brief stories that appear as our gospel text for today. In the first, Jesus comes home and on the Sabbath preaches in the synagogue. What strikes me is not that the people are upset about his preaching. People have always gotten upset, upset about preaching. What surprises me is that as a result, Jesus is not able to do any deeds of power except for the few sick people that he laid his hands on and healed. Something happens in that synagogue that keeps the energy of God's reign already drawing near from getting in. There is no entrance ramp. Even Jesus is shocked at its strength. The Gospel writer doesn't tell us actually what Jesus said in the sermon. He only tells us their reaction to the message. The energy in the synagogue turns. They were astounded and they became critical. Their comments turned to insults. Jesus is mentioned as son of Mary, a strange construction in the first century when the father would have been mentioned. Are they saying something about this fatherless child, this Ill illegitimate voice? And they say that he's nothing but a carpenter. We hear carpenter is a skilled and prized trade. However, the actual meaning here is more like manual laborer. Who does this illegitimate laborer think he is? He was familiar to them. They knew him as the eldest child of a large clan, a child like their own children, none of whom was traipsing around the countryside, cleansing lepers and casting out demons. Who does he think he is? I suspect that all of these comments and more, you know how it happens, were made at the coffee hour. You can almost picture the crowd turning from Jesus toward one another, whispering in each other's ears, their communal connection closing off this outside influence. As a community, they draw the circle closer. Their connection becomes a kind of centripetal force, pulling them harder and tighter together. Is it any wonder that a community that uses insecurity and anxiety and suspicion as its connection is impervious to the reign of God? It's no wonder that Jesus cannot break through. It's no wonder that this community cannot experience deeds of liberating power. It has closed itself off. This is a warning to any community of faith that it should evaluate what it is that connects the community. Is it this kind of narcissistic energy always turned inward? Does it spin so strongly round and round that there are no longer any entrance ramps for new voices? new energy, new ideas, no exit ramps to get away from the fear and anger? Is it a closed system, unopened to change, to possibility, to opportunity, facing only inside the circle? This happens so easily in communities because almost by nature we use our deep insecurity or our prejudice, 
our anxiety and suspicion to keep connected. As church, we will even couch it all in God language. We want to belong, but we organize our judgment, we organize around judgment of the other, the stranger, the enemy, the wounded, the voiceless. We create a community that looks and sounds just like we do. God help the prophet who comes to announce a different perspective. You can see this in churches that become rigid and hardened theologically, no questions allowed. You see this in politics where there is only win or lose. You see this in family systems that assign members to particular roles that are not allowed to change. You see this in congregations that are organized around the past or one personality or a particular cultural expression. It happens in just about every community. In the second brief story in today's gospel, we see what is instructive for us through Jesus' reaction. He's amazed by the power of their unbelief. He's amazed at how it can stop even the grace of God. And instead of stewing or arguing his case or justifying his perspective or just getting stuck in the traffic circle, he moves on to another village. He sends the disciples out two by two to find places that will come alive with a new spirit. Strap on your sandals, take your staff, and find the households that are open to you. Find the places, the communities, where connections are open and wide and welcoming of the message. Places where the circle of people will welcome this new way of love, compassion, healing, and justice to enter. And when you are rejected, pick yourself back up, dust yourself off and move on. Do not do what everyone else does. Do not fight about it or stand your ground or prove that you're right or just lay in bed terrified about being terrified. This is the grace of Jesus' action here. Deep within his own being is love, compassion, healing, and justice. And he moves on. The crucifixion is the symbol of the world stuck in this loop, this circle. Organized around fear, it marshals the weapons of power to kill the messenger, to demean the opponent, to silence the prophet. It's terrified of forgiveness and weakness, scared to death of losing, and it cannot trust vulnerability, love, or compassion. And here's the good news for us today. Easter is God's answer to the loop, to the circle. Jesus suddenly appears on the inside of the locked doors, on the other side of our walls, inside our circles. Easter life provides a way out even as it lets the new voice in. Instead of limits, this Easter life is one of possibility and of opportunity. This Easter life enriches deeds of healing and peacemaking. This Easter life brings people together. This Easter life spins the circle toward openness, where each of us find, and our faith communities find ourselves turning outward to the world with a kind of grace and generosity that is truly prophetic and truly good news for all. The Spirit of Jesus leads us, pulls us together, makes us a new community, and then sends us out two by two, three by three into the neighborhood where the love of God is already flowing, where God's presence is known in the eyes of the other, the stranger, the enemy, the wounded, the voiceless where we too will discover that Jesus is enough, that the good news is sufficient, that God's love and forgiveness is enough, that the water and the word of baptism is enough, 
that the meal of bread and wine, Christ's own body and blood, is enough. Where the circle of our lives spins toward openness, and we find ourselves turning to the world with a kind of grace and generosity that is truly prophetic and truly good news for all. May it be so among us. Let us pray. Come to us, risen Lord Jesus, and grant us faith enough to share the good news. Send us, filled with the breath of your Holy Spirit, to breathe peace into fearful lives, to love one another as we have been loved, to welcome the stranger and make friends of enemies, to forgive the sins that bind others to the past, to serve on bended knee all in need of care, to be your wounded and risen body in the world, and to enter with joy God's inbreaking, startling future. 